Okay, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Chris Dalski, the uh, Climate Services Program Manager for Eastern Region, and this is our monthly uh, climate webinar series. And today we're going to be hearing from a couple of people down at the National Centers for Environmental Information in Asheville, North Carolina, also formerly known as NCDC, although that um, acronym hasn't been used now for quite a while. Um, we're going to start today talking about an update on uh, tools and resources from NCEI. Um, our first speaker today is going to be Glenn Kerr. Glenn is a physical scientist and the chief of NCEI's customer's engagement section, where he oversees direct interaction with customers to fulfill their needs for climate data sets, products, and services, as well for broader engagement to understand stakeholder requirements and unique use cases for NCEI data. Prior to joining NCEI, Glenn served as the executive director for the American Association of State Climatologists, also known as the ASC and the commander of the U.S. Air Force's 14th Weather Squadron, which provided specialized climate support to the Department of Defense. So, Glenn, if you're ready, we'll uh, hand control over to you. Take it away. Scott is a meteorologist with NCEI's Climate Sciences and Services Division and is celebrating his 31st year at NOAA. After five years in the National Weather Service, serving in Eastern and Central Regional Offices during the modernization era, Scott joined NCEI and has spent the majority of his career in user engagement, Along with a stint in climate monitoring, Scott enjoys connecting users with the data they need that is appropriate for their applications. And our last speaker today will be Dr. Sandra Rain. Dr. Rain joined NCEI's Climate Services Science and Services Division in July 2022 as a physical scientist to engage with it and deliver valuable climate information to various stakeholders. Although new to NCEI, she is not new to climate services having also served as a regional climatologist for the Southeast Regional Climate Center, where she co-partnered with NIDAS to create the Southeast Climate Webinar Series. She's also worked with the Weather Research and Forecast Model for the Desert Research Institute's Naval Earth Sciences and Engineering Program. Dr. Rain received her PhD from the University of Nevada at Reno. So, um, Glenn, it looks like you're back. Um, if you're ready to go, we're going to let you go at it. Okay, just checking that you can hear me. Yeah, I can hear you fine. Thanks. Okay. Thanks, and thanks to everyone. Um, hopefully, that will be our one little hiccup as we get started today. Um, so, as you just heard, uh, I am Glenn Kerr, and I'm the chief of NCEI's customer engagement session. I really appreciate your making time to watch today's webinar on NCEI tools and resources, and I hope you'll find it useful in acquainting you with what we have to offer here to help you in your job and in serving your customers. Before we dive into the tools and resources, I want to take a moment to provide a brief NCEI overview. As you likely know, NCEI is the nation's leading authority for environmental data, and we manage one of the world's largest archives of atmospheric, coastal, geophysical, and oceanic data and research. And that's all good stuff, however, it doesn't stop there. We also engage with a wide spectrum of customers to understand their needs and specific use cases for climate data and to develop products and services to unlock the value of that data and inform stakeholder decisions to improve operations and to protect people and resources. We have a nationwide team working to accomplish all this work. Of course, our headquarters is here in Asheville, North Carolina. And we have centers in Boulder, Colorado, Stennis Space Center in Mississippi, and of course, Silver Springs. But we also have regional climate centers in each of the six regions. You'll see those indicated by the colors on the map. And their specific locations are indicated by the gray squares. Finally, we also have six regional climate services directors who engage with stakeholders in those regions and coordinate for the provision of climate services. And we have a complement of cooperative institutes indicated with the red ovals, which are also integral to our mission. So now it's time to get into the products. NCEI offers access to more than 26,000 data sets and products, which can be a daunting proposition when you're trying to find exactly what you need. But never fear, our mm -hmm. climate monitoring section has provided sp a specific website tailored to provide quick links to the products and data you most commonly need as you do your work. And if you still have an unmet need, we have a dedicated team of customer service representatives who are experts in our data sets and products and will be happy to connect you with what you need. You can access them by emailing or calling 
and there's a phone number and email provided at the footer of each of the NCEI web pages. And so now with no further ado, I'd like to pass the baton to one of those folks that you were just introduced to, Scott Stevens, and he's gonna step you through a number of products. So take it away, Scott. Hey, thanks, Glenn, and thanks for having us this afternoon. I, I, I wanted to spend just a moment on that link that uh, uh, Glenn just uh, brought to you. This is a great uh, link, really, to our most popular products list. Uh, it's really geared for the WFOs and for some of their operational needs. Uh, you'll find it topically organized to help you navigate the website quickly. And the main thing it's there is to save you some time to get to the uh, weather and climate tidbits that you're searching for for whatever uh, whatever purpose on the day you need it. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. The map tool is a great starting point uh, for data discovery. This is this is really the tool that I use uh, first to find the station. Uh, it's a great resource to spatially interrogate station and data set availability. Uh, you can look at uh, metadata and element inventories from here, and you can also order directly uh, from within the map tool. Uh, now, just a word on ordering. Uh, ordering data, everything's free online. So, uh, you know, if you're accessing anything from the online system, it's free to all users. Uh, really, the only things that we're charging for these days are going to be certification of data, you know, for for legal purposes, you know, if we're sending out ribbon and seal certifications, those are still uh, uh, cost recovery based. Uh, certain hard media, uh, let's say, you know, th there's still some CDs and DVDs that we're sending out of here, uh, and also if there's data uh, that's not on spinning disk, let's say we've got data in the deep archive that we're going to have to pull out of, you know, off tape. And we're going to have to stage for uh, for for download. In those cases, we do charge for cost recovery. Of course, uh, you folks, you know, since you're in the weather service family, uh, pretty much everything's free. Just make the request, and we'll try to fulfill it uh, to the best of our ability. Let's go ahead and go to the next slide. So the climate data online system is really good for those folks that don't like maps and they like to use text-based searches. This is going to be pointing at all of our legacy data sets like uh, GHCN Daily, uh, Global Summary of the Month, uh, and Global Summary of the Year, those derivative data sets. Uh, this interface is going to be replaced by something called Common Access. It's actually out there already. It's on the NCI main page. And if you go into the access link from the NCI homepage, uh, you can follow that through to Common Access and you can search for, for data sets there as well. Uh, I still refer a lot of folks to, to this legacy CDO page, mainly because of its ease of use. Uh, next slide. Our climate monitoring section maintains some of the most popular pages, including uh, the climate at a glance tool. Now, if, if you've been on the climate at a glance page in the last year or so, you may have encountered some slowness or even unresponsiveness at times, but this has been recoded. Uh, there was a bottleneck with, off our Threads data server, and so Climate at a Glance is now pointing at a different data source. So if you go on there now, I think you'll find it very responsive, very responsive, much more reliable. I'd give it a try. Uh, the Climate at a Glance pages contain both U.S. and global mapping capability, as well as some time series output all the way down to the city level. Uh, you've got rankings, and you've got uh, Haywood plots as well. The Climate at a Glance uh, system goes hand in hand uh, with Climate Monitoring's monthly climate reports that are released, generally speaking, around mid-month. Mid uh, the U.S. report comes out first, uh, usually around the beginning of the second week, and then the, the global data comes out, the global report comes out around mid-month, about a week later, uh, as there's a little bit of a lag time uh, getting that international data. Um, these reports serve as a national and global climate scorekeeper, uh, providing a historical perspective and also those all important uh, national and global rankings. Uh, the billion dollar weather and climate disasters keeps track of those big events to affect the US. Traditionally, this page has been updated quarterly, but monthly updates just started uh, with this page. So the, the, the updates cadence is gonna be a little bit faster, probably more useful. 
Uh, just as a little tidbit, uh, the since we started tracking events on the Billion Dollar Weather and Climate Disasters page, uh, it goes back to 1980, there have been 355 events uh, exceeding 2.54 trillion uh, in adjusted losses. So this page is very popular with the media and also with uh, policymakers as well. The State Climate Extremes Committee adjudicates or evaluates potential state records for adjudication. Um, so if you have a record candidate, you know you can contact NCEI to activate the committee. And then there's going to be five voting members on that committee. You've got the WFO, uh, you've got the uh, NWS region rep, there's also the uh, RCC rep, the state climatologist, as well as the NCEI rep, which is the, uh, the, the chair of the committee. So if the record is accepted, uh, it's stored with all the other records uh, and the tracked elements on the committee webpage. So you can go back and refer historically to all of those statewide uh, statewide records that are that are maintained on the website. The daily U.S. snowfall and snow depth uh, data are updated each day uh, for those snow stations in GHC and D. So you can get a, a near real time evaluation of snowfall and snow depth. And then we've got uh, the National Integrated Drought Information System, or drought.gov. This is your resource for all things drought. Uh, there's been a recently added addition to drought.gov. If you go to drought.gov forward slash states, that's gonna provide a current summary of drought using the weekly US Drought Monitor product. There's also current dr drought indices there, as well as outlooks and forecasts. And you've also got uh, historical uh, drought data. Again, that's gonna be targeted down to the statewide level. That might be useful for you and, and also some of your drought partners. All right, let's go to the next slide. The Global Historical Climatology Network really is a building block data set. The daily data uh, produces the monthly and uh, annual products. Now, a new addition is gonna be the GHCN hourly data set. This is gonna replace the longstanding hourly database known as the Integrated Surface Database. Uh, GHCN hourly is already in beta, but it's gonna be uh, going prime time a little bit later on this year. The GHCN daily data set is gonna include co-op data, but you've also got uh, RAWs and Snowtail and Cocoa RAWs and our own Climate Reference Network data goes into that database, in addition to the uh, airport data, both domestic and international. The station data, gets projected onto a five kilometer grid. We call this database Incline Grid. And the Incline Grid was initially produced at a monthly time scale, but it's now available daily for both temperature and precipitation elements. You can also get county average data now on a daily basis uh, at the daily time scale. So the Incline Grid data is upscaled to produce the county, uh, divisional, uh, statewide, regional, and national products, including the National Temperature Index that's used in so many of the uh, climate monitoring applications that we just talked about. Next slide. Now, I'll, I'll spend a few slides talking about some of the derivative data sets that GHCN data produces. One of these is the past weather tool. Uh, there's a widget on the main homepage. Uh, it's, uh, it's front and center. It's beside recent weather. If you go to ncei.no.gov, you can put in a zip code or a, st or a, or a town, and it's gonna bring this page up that you see here. It's gonna give you graphics, uh, there's, uh, uh, you know, summaries that you can generate on the fly, and there's also exportable formats. You can you can export this data in, in CSV, JSON, uh, XML. There's uh, text formats as well. Uh, let's go to the next slide. So the daily records tool is another useful tool uh, that scrapes GHCN daily. It generates records uh, for the U.S. and internationally. Uh, this is a media darling. Um, but just a, a word of caution on this data set, GHCND is a database of over 100,000 stations. The daily records tool is going to take those stations that have at least 30 years of, of data, as well as I believe it's 182 days of data within any given year. So it has to meet that criteria to, to qualify for the calculation. But as you guys know, some stations are better than others. So just keep that in mind when you evaluate the data uh, you need to consider station quality, consider the completeness of the station when you're reviewing the results here. Uh, next slide. 
one of our most popular, if not the most popular, uh, in situ data products that we've had that we have is the local climatological data. This has been around for many decades in one form or another. Uh, the product is created by merging hourly, daily, and monthly data feeds, and uh, you know, harkening back to what we talked about, GHC and hourly. This is going to be the underpinnings of this product as well coming up soon. So what we're going to have is probably two products running in parallel, one based on the legacy data as well as the new uh, GHC and hourly data. So the local climatological data will ultimately be replaced by that, and that transition period is going to start later this year. Next slide. The Storm Events Database, uh, I'm sure you all are all familiar with this. It's uh, the compilation of storm data submitted by all 122 uh, National Weather Service offices and their WCMs. Uh, tornado and hail data go all the way back to 1950. Uh, the user interface that you see here is limited to uh, queries uh, returning 500 or fewer reports. So if you need more, uh, the entire database is downloadable in CSV format. Uh, if you happen to need the whole thing. Now, while the storm events database is ground truth data, I like to think of this this other database more as remotely sensed. Uh, that's the that's SWITI or the Severe Weather Data Inventory. You can see the link here in the lower left of this slide. This is going to be primarily based on NextRed Level Three uh, algorithms. Uh, you've got storm centroids, you've got hail index, you've got mesocyclone, you've got TVS. Uh, so when you're considering the SWITI portion of this, consider the RDA RPG build. So for example, if you've got hail index today, that's actually a really good product, but hail index back in 1994 wasn't as good. So just consider that when you're evaluating this data. I'll also make mention of the lightning data. We do archive VISLA's uh, National Lightning Detection Network data. We're not archiving for what it's worth the Earth Network stuff, but the VISLA data is available. It's freely available to all NOAA.gov domain, but there is a fairly strict licensing agreement with Visola, so we can't redistribute that data outside of the NOAA.gov domain. So what I would recommend, if you're getting if you're getting requests, uh, external requests for that data, it really does need to go through Visola. Specifically, uh, their vendor for historical data is called CoreLogic. They have a, uh, a web page called StrikeNet. You can just Google that; that will come right up. StrikeNet. And so if you've got someone who's had a CG strike, it's knocked out their HVAC system, and they're, they're in an insurance claim uh, and, and need the lightning data, refer them out to CoreLogic and StrikeNet. I think the going rate for a, for a lightning strike product right now is a couple hundred bucks if they're looking for a specific you know, street level mapping kind of deal. If they're looking for bulk data, they would need to go directly to, to uh, Visola Corporate. But within NOAA.gov, if you're, if you're coming in from that domain, we're seeing you as NOAA.gov, it's all going to be free. Bulk access to that's available, too. We do have that in a restricted uh, uh, directory that you can get, get to, but just remember to keep it in the family. Next slide. The comparative climatic data is powered by no, both normals and extremes data. Uh, this is useful for media inquiries. We get a lot of these media requests for top 10 lists and such. Uh, the tables are good. You can see them here. They're, they're, a lot of these are very useful. The, the ones that I would be a little more wary of are the ones that have been discontinued for some time. Uh, you know, with the commissioning of ASOS, we lost a lot of the sunshine data, and so some of the sunshine and cloudiness information is going to be dated. Having said that, we still get quite a few requests for those, so they're still popular even though they're old. Uh, right now, this is being powered by the 81 to 2010 Climate Normal uh, Series. Uh, I'm told that within the next month or so, this is going to be updated uh, to reflect uh, the 1991 to 2020 normals. Uh, next slide. So I would be remiss if I didn't spend just a minute talking about all the data migration efforts to the cloud. There's a big uh, effort and push uh, to get NCEI and NOAA data at large to the cloud. I'm sure you've probably heard of the NOAA Open Data Dissemination, or NOD, that used to be called the Big Data Project. Uh, internal to NESDIS, we call it NCCF, for the NESDIS Common Cloud Framework. So we've got more and more going to the cloud. All Everything must go eventually. Uh, the Weather Service is pushing uh, uh, you know, the NCEP model data out there uh, to the cloud right now. We've got all the GOES RST, you know, 16 through 18 data is available in the cloud. 
Uh, there's increasing amounts of JPSS data uh, that's getting out there, you know, in case you want to get your hands on some VIRS data. Uh, all the next red level two and level three data is out there as well. And some of our big in situ data sets like GHC and daily, like the integrated surface database, certainly GHC and hourly will be going there uh, shortly. Uh, let me take an opportunity to plug the weather and climate toolkit. Uh, I know many of you are you have used this in the past. This is a great tool. It's available freely on the website. It's Java based and platform independent. Uh, it's going to interface directly with these cloud services. Um, so you can render imagery and visualize Im imagery on the fly from within the tool. Uh, back in the day, not so long ago, and you can still do it now, uh, you would have to place an order through the tape archive. And then when you got an email back, there would be a order number and you would paste that in the tool and you would, you would list the files and you could you could visualize the imagery you can still like I said you can still place those kind of orders but why do that when you've already got you know a direct interface uh, with those cloud providers within the latest version of the weather and climate toolkit if you haven't looked at it in a while I would encourage you to take a look at it maybe download it kick the tires and with that I will pass it off to Sandra who's going to talk about uh, our Climate Normals product suite, as well as our partnerships with the uh, regional climate centers and the state climate offices. Sandra. All right, thanks, Scott. Um, it wouldn't be NCI if we didn't talk about Normals data. So as you know, NCI generates the official U.S. Climate Normals every 10 years, with the most recent one being from 1991 to 2020. We do have the gridded monthly and daily normals based off the NCLIME grid data set. And what you may not know is we also have ENSO gridded normals as well. These are monthly climate normals for five different phase categories of ENSO, strong La Nina, weak La Nina, neutral, weak El Nino, and strong El Nino. The ENSO normals are centered around the 15 year running average instead of the traditional 30 year normal. And they include ENSO maximum temperatures, ENSO minimum temperatures, and ENSO precipitation. There's documentation and more information about the U.S. climate normals on the website under the gridded data tab for the ENSO stuff. Uh, next slide. Another great feature with the climate normals is the quick access tool, which gives a snapshot look at stations 30 year or 15 year normals in monthly, daily, hourly, and annual slash seasonal quick views of the data. It's got great graphics and it's a pretty handy and easy to use tool if you need a quick access. All right, next slide. So to highlight other resources, as mentioned, NCI manages the Regional Climate Center program with six climate centers throughout the US. They provide more tools and research about each region that they are connected with. And they also have specific research themes associated with each one. For instance, the High Plains and Midwestern RCCs have a thematic focus on agriculture and water resources, while the Southeast RCC has a focus on public health. You can access each RCC's website from our website, and we are celebrating the 40th anniversary of the Regional Climate Center program, and we'll be producing a series of news stories highlighting the program's accomplishments, so be on the lookout for various articles in our news section. I believe there are already two there. Next slide. These RCCs create tools using NCI and NWS data. One such tool is a tabular climate normals tool from the High Plains Regional Climate Center. It gives another easy view of monthly and annual normals, as well as an option to export this data to a CSV format. You can check out the stations in the station query. All right, next slide. The Northeast RCC also created a climate normals tool using the gridded normals data. This is another easy to use, nice way to visualize the data in a map like form. It gives various area searches, uh, including county and basin areas. You can change the color of the map, which I thought was a nice feature, and then download the image in various file formats for any presentations. Next slide. And I just wanted to point out that there, along with the regional climate centers, there are state climate offices. Now, NCEI does not officially manage these offices, but we do work together with them and the RCCs work together with them as well. They also provide valuable resources, tools, and research. The only state that does not have a state climate office is Massachusetts. 
Some of them even manage a mesonet, such as the North Carolina State Climate Office with their Econet stations, and Oklahoma has a great mesonet program as well, as I'm sure many of you are aware of. But I just wanted to remind you that the State Climate Offices are a valuable resource. Next slide. So for the recap of recent updates and future plans, the Billion Dollar Disasters Tool now has monthly updates and county level data. The Climate Monitoring National Maps now provide daily, weekly, and month to date gridded level data down to the county level. The Comparative Climate Data will be updated in June. GHCN hourly data is in the works and should be out sometime later this year. The Climate Data Online tool will be discontinued by the end of the year with common access to replace it. And we are continuing uh, the data migration into the cloud. Next slide. So with that, we all wanna thank you for having us and ask if there are any questions. Great, thank you guys. This is uh, Jenna Myers and I put a, a message in the chat box. If anybody has any questions, please submit them through the um, chat box. As of right now, I don't see any questions coming through, but do we have any questions from um, the other panelists that we have? Yeah, I'll ask a question here. Um, this is uh, Chris here from uh, Eastern Region. So what's a great way if people are looking for a certain tool? Um, maybe sometimes, you know, a lot of times you surf around on the NCEI website and then you kind of come across something and, you know, you're like, oh, later on, a couple months later, that might be good to look at. What is a good way to kind of find a tool for what you're looking for if you don't? know what the name of that tool is um what where is a good starting point for that i guess that would be a, a good question i'd like to ask well we're all sitting here wondering who's going to take that one <laughs> uh, i'll start with just uh mentioning that uh nws resource page is really a great uh lead-in for that it, it has, just the way it's broken down, it was created by a Karen Gleason in conjunction with a lot of uh, input from National Weather Service folks. And if you uh, can go to that, in fact, let me just pop that right back up here. Um, we consciously decided to play it safe and do no live, <laughs> live demos, which was pretty good since I, uh, there it is since I, I kind of dropped out right at the beginning. But as you can see right through here, um, and, and the uh, URL for that is right here in the blue box, but you can start with an element, whether you're interested in TIP and precip, and that list goes on, you know, way below that screen capture. If you're interested in drought, snow, wind, kind of the big, you know, the big four or five things people are looking at, or you can uh, break it down by spatial resolution. Are you looking for uh, in situ data, gridded data, that type of thing, the type of, of output you put together, um, special data and tools, and then also OCONUS, which would cover, um, you know, Puerto Rico, Alaska, and Hawaii. Um, and so, and then there's a lot of references to that. So I think that's a great starting point. And with that, I'm gonna kick it over to see if Scott has any insight that he'd like to add. Yeah, I agree. I think that's probably the best, the, one of the best resource link uh, uh, compilations that I've seen. Um, you know, one of the, one of the things that we, problems that we've had over the years. A lot of times we have, you know, certain data sets, data set names associated with things that are not really descriptive, like local climatological data. What does that mean, right? So, uh, this kind of parses through that and allows you to to kind of get to the meat of the matter. I think. Okay, Chris, right, we do have you. a question um, online. Um, we do have a question that came through, um, and and I'll, I'll I can answer it too um, as long as Glenn or anyone there can give me the links. But they they wanted to know if um, someone was going to be sending out a list with all the links because you guys did provide a lot of links in your presentation. So if um, either that or I can send the, the the PDF slides across if if you don't mind. I think we could do either one of those. We could definitely compile those links, but if you if you wanted to just send the slides, that's that's a good way to do that as well. 
All right, so what we usually do is we post um, the recording on our Climate Services Seminar Series page, and then we can just include uh, a link to the PDF there. Um, I'm not seeing any other questions, but just real quick from myself, this resources page that you just showed us, for the it's, it's a National Weather Service list. Is this specifically for our offices? Is this an internal site or is it, it is an external uh, website, I'm, I'm assuming? Yeah, it's it's definitely external. If you, in fact, if you just go to the the, the Gateway website, you know, ncei.noaa.gov, um, and you go across the top, there will be a, a place for monitoring. If you hit monitoring, you'll see it right there as part of the resources, or you can put this specific URL in to go directly to the uh, website. Okay, great. Um... I think we're getting some, just some more links are being entered into the chat here. I don't see a question though. I have a, a question I was gonna ask sure. um, about the billion dollar weather disasters page. So anyone that attended last week's um, climate prediction applications um, workshop down there in Asheville, there was a lot of talk and a lot of side presentations about, you know, kind of, other tools and some of them were also developed also by NCI or the weather services for people who yeah. weren't there um because we haven't shared a lot of the, the links or anything from the presentation you met yet but um there was a lot of talk that fed off that resource so when you go to update that page one of the things sometimes that has happened in big expensive events is sometimes the cost balloon so this is something that's come up from the weather offices over the years talking to people who do storm data a lot of times you get an early estimate and then it grows and grows and grows and grows. Is that something you're going to look into updating on that page? Like if the amount balloons over time as you get new estimates in, will we get more frequent updates on costs? Or is it still something where you might just go back in and update it like, you know, once a year or once every several months or something like that? I'm not, Chris, I'm not quite sure about that. Adam Smith is, of course, your go-to. Uh, you know, for the billion dollar weather disasters page. I want to say that he does adjust that. You know, it's not like storm data where, where that kind of gets frozen. Uh, I want to say he does update that, but that would be something that we would need to direct directly to Adam, and, and he could certainly provide some feedback on that. Yeah, I agree with Scott on that. Um, I, as you all know, he'll do a retrospective of the previous year, and I think um, that would be the time he'd account for some of those some of those updates are increasing in cost, but he'd be the expert to go to for that. Okay, thank you. Yeah, because it was like a really good example. Of this was brought up to me a number of years ago. There was a really huge um, hailstorm that happened in the Phoenix suburbs. I want to say this was over like a decade ago when it hit a lot of really affluent areas. And so when it hit at the time, it was a big event. And I was talking with the former science and operations officer who's been retired now for a while down there at the time. And he told me like, over the years how much that ballooned up and i was talking to someone from boulder um that works in that office a few years ago and they're like you hey, go back and look at that event and like from what the initial cost was to what it ended up as it ballooned like a lot from what the office had to go with i think in storm data originally that they were kind of locked out from updating that total so that's why i was just curious about that kind of stuff because that is there are some events where that's known to happen um, and sometimes it takes a year or two just from all the insurance litigation and stuff like that to shake itself out in the system and get those totals more uh, refined. So thanks for answering that. Okay, I'm not seeing any other questions, but someone did post a ton of the links in our chat. So I will grab those and include them um, in our summary write-up that we post online. But other than that, thank you guys so much for presenting today, and um, we really appreciate it. And I guess we will see you guys next time <clears throat> for our webinar in June. Um, I will post, uh, I will send an announcement out across the listserv, and we're going to have somebody from George Washington University um, um, give a talk on climate change and resilience across the sectors. So thank you guys. Thank you guys for giving us an update on NCEI resources and tools. And Chris, I just wanted to, I'll give you the last, the last word there, <laughs> or, or if any of you, um, anyone else has one final thought, let, let me know. Yeah, I just want to thank the panelists we've had here today. And thanks for anyone who submitted questions and just keep an eye out for topics. And also, if you do have suggestions in the field for future monthly um, webinars, talk to your regional climate um, program leader, and they will let us know on the group and we'll try to work to get them scheduled because we, 
do want to see you know, get topics that you are engaged with and want to have um, people present on, find out information on. So thanks. Yep. All right. Thank you guys. Have a great day.